$663 billion. That is how much President Obama has set aside for the Department of Defense and the continuation of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in his 2010 budget. Adjusting for inflation, this is a slight increase from 2009. While the details of how the White House plans to distribute that money won't be known until April, there is a lot of talk about changes in priorities. So which priorities are being discussed and which are not? The Obama administration has talked about their intent to expand the size of the force, uh, the Army and, and the Marines, the Army to about 540,000 troops and the Marines to 202,000 troops. And so a large part of the increase is going to go for expanding the size of the force and increasing military pay. So I expect they'll do, you know, some modest cuts to a few weapon systems to pay for that increase, but then they're going to be increasing the size of the budget as a whole also. A hint as to which weapon systems might be cut came in Obama's speech to Congress last week. We'll eliminate the no-bid contracts that have wasted billions in Iraq. And and reform and, and reform our defense budget so that we're not paying for Cold War era weapon systems we don't use. The biggest issue at the moment is the F-22, this enormously expensive fighter, about $350 million a copy. It hasn't even been used in in Iraq because it's just irrelevant to the Iraq war. So they keep adding on new electronics to try to make it uh, more usable. And meanwhile, the, the costs just, just escalate. But now there's an enormous uh, campaign going on on the part of the manufacturer, the principal one being Lockheed Martin, the largest in the world, which has uh, strategically placed pieces of this program in 44 of the 50 states to create a political constituency for the plane. And that's probably the reason that about 200 members of Congress have signed this letter to the president saying we really need the F-22. They don't really say why, except in the, in the, in the most vague terms. Um, but occasionally they, you know, they mention, you know, some inflated, I believe, uh, job estimates for, for how many jobs are, are dependent on this, on this plane. Amidst the limited discussion of military spending, the expense that few are addressing is the U.S.'s vast network of foreign military bases. In fact, only one member of Congress, Republican Ron Paul, has consistently spoken on the topic. Reject the notion that we need to run an empire. We can't afford it. It's going to come down. It always comes down. It has come down all throughout history because eventually the currency is destroyed. We're in, uh, we're in 130 countries. We have 700 bases. Our military now is in worse shape than it was five years ago, according to our military. So it's time we look at the strategic, the philosophic problems. And I say, unless we do this, this will, be, this will end badly. It's clear that the Defense Department is not um, being open about all of the bases. And uh, so when they put out a number like we have about 750 bases, but then there are uh, some important ones, as for example in Saudi Arabia, that they don't, they don't count. Um, so I think a better estimate is around 1,000 bases. Now it's important to know these are mostly very small facilities with a communications tower. Um, uh, they're not, you know, these giant bases such as, for example, the green zone in, in, uh, in Iraq. And when you ask how much does it cost us to have this empire, it's not as easy to answer as, as it should be uh, because the, the Defense Department doesn't have a number that it assigns to the costs of overseas bases versus domestic bases. But you can get a rough idea from the fact that about 20% of our forces, excluding the ones that are in Iraq and Afghanistan, are based overseas as opposed to the 80% that are, that are based in the United States. If you account for, those for what those forces cost and the equipment and the construction of the bases and the operations of the bases, 
um, and the weapons that are there, um, you come to a figure of about $100 billion. While this $100 billion network receives very little exposure inside the U.S., it is a contentious issue in many of the countries that play host to U.S. bases. Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa made headlines in 2007 when he announced his intention to close Ecuador's U.S. air base, once the lease expired in 2009, an intention his government has since solidified by including a prohibition on foreign military bases in the recently approved constitution. De extender el tratado. Extenderíamos el tratado siempre y cuando Estados Unidos nos permita poner una base ecuatoriana en Miami. Most recently in the news is is Kyrgyzstan. So we've had this base there that that um, we've been using for staging for Afghanistan, and um, the the Kyrgyzstan government just said we're going to get rid of the U the U.S. because the Russians will pay us more to be there. So we were paying them two million dollars a year. Um, between 2001, when this base was established, and 2006. 2006, the fee went up to $20 million, which we paid, in addition to uh, $100 million in additional economic funds for, for Kyrgyzstan. So it's kind of a bidding war at this stage. So I think there is a growing movement um, around the world. Countries, you know, people don't like to be occupied as more and more uh, of these examples occur, they're going to embolden and encourage other countries to do likewise. There was a, a conference just this past weekend at American University bringing together folks from uh, 11 different countries around the world, um, all of whom have, have uh, anti-bases movements. Sometimes it seems as if these movements aren't having an effect, that the Pentagon is really ignoring them. but but. They're really not ignoring them. The Pentagon did a review back in 2003 and did some, had a plan at least to, to pull back on you know, quite a number of bases, particularly in Germany and, and Japan. And they haven't you know, implemented those plans very far uh, to date. But the document that, that talked about this plan um, explicitly said, um, we're doing this in part to address the threat of anti-access uh, movements in these countries. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal. Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst Antonia Yuhas. The news magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington is a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through the myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a this great speaking voice that everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said, this is going to change everything. And the way our countries govern, it's going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said, in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matter. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. 
The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing that has happened in the history of the United States. Knowledge is power. We need an honest news system. We need the real news. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not gonna sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State.